Hello everyone, today we talk about 15th century European artillery. Um, a moment in history in which, for the first time, uh, in West we have um, historically uh, documented the differentiation in two different um, categories um, of the single uh, artillery um, weapons. Um, it's still at a very primitive form telling the truth because um, actually the the artillery had already been around since uh, some people stick to the, the the actual evidence that we have at the beginning of the 14th century but other people like me think that um, really th there probably were certain certain minor weapons that were kind of just very random and um, and and bizarre th um, things um, since the the, the the very end of the 13th um, uh, already. Um, however, up to the um, the 15th century, we don't really have a clear uh, categorization of the different weapons. Partly because objectively, um, this differentiation was um, um, initially much uh, smaller in the sense that the, the, the few weapons that existed were derived from from common um, m shapes, let's say, uh, methods of production. Um, uh, the the very first um, the very first uh, guns were made up by um, um, were made up by the potters because. Um, they were at the time the only uh, the only craftsmen who, who had um, the, um, the means um, to to create something with a uh, with a cylindrical shape thanks to the lathe. Um, so in fact, the, the 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 term in French at the time that was mostly spread was pot uh, de fer, which, which means mm, uh, you know a pot in fact. Um, and and, and r regarding names, um, I, I think I have to stress the importance of these um, uh, in, in this video because as I was saying, um, uh, I was talking about categories essentially of, of weapons so that you can attach to a name or to a group of name the, uh, you know, the, uh, a particular kind of weaponry. But here the, the modern mind um, uh, of ours is a bit um, uh, tricked because we, um <coughs> after the encyclopedia, essentially we think uh, in very rational and and uh, categorical terms that to one name corresponds a certain type of weaponry. Well, this was for the Middle Ages and even for most part of the modern era uh, not true. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a lot of confusions, a lot of different names because there was no really uh, scientific, uh, scientifically um, a scientific category attached to the single name. So this is something very famous for every historian that has studied, for instance, I don't know, during the modern age, uh, the moment of transition between the arquebus and the musket. Uh, in the sources, um, everybody knows uh, that n that basically um, certain authors refer to uh, arque um, arquebuses like muskets and vice versa. Um, because there was not really, it was not really important. It was mostly, uh, and the same terms uh, tended to depict more of an idea, um, or or a way of naming things that than rather specifying what, what what kind of type it was. And that's the reason, for instance, why you have to read carefully every source in all its length. Because if you just go like picking things at the supermarket, in in the source is just a name you actually cannot make um, a good critics to how that name uh, is used and what it basically means for the order in absence of a scientific categorization. Um, <coughs> so even today we will um, essentially uh, try to, um, um, to, to describe certain categories um, of weaponry as we think, w is historically speaking, to to determine for the 15th century, like for what they were, and mm, trying to understand 
what was their use what on the base of their the characteristics that we know uh, about them and and why exactly the 15th century and i'd say the beginning and the mid of the 15th century especially because this is a time in the modern um excuse me in the in the in western warfare into which artillery um kicks uh, in um <coughs> in very prominent use especially in the 20s of the 15th century every let's say up to dated um european prince had to have um his own um artillery park in his own um uh, arsenal if he wanted to <laughs> if he wanted really to accomplish something really before the the 16th century um artillery wasn't um you know um something that could really make mm, battles uh, go in, in you know could make could really make the 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 result of battles change um on a regular base but let's say that uh, at this time from the end of the 14th century um and the beginning of 15th century um mm, mm, guns uh, whether they were han handguns uh, today we're talking just about artillery or artillery um start to become a tactical variable that cannot be ignored that is not um <coughs> virtually an influence and that starts uh, in this sense even to to see a di diversification uh, on the base of uh, the particular use uh, it was thought for um <coughs> so we mm, and how do we know this well of course there is archaeology but um we still rely uh, most of the times on on sources because um on, on documentary sources because if um you know, not everything from that time had arrived to us, archaeologically speaking. Um, and we can't um, fully understand what, what was practically in use at that time, aside from these things that we have that, that could be, however, um, incomplete samples um, relatively to the, the world picture. So, when in sources we find written that there are very different types of weapons like bombards, guns, serpentines, fowlers, collets, coupled, uh culverines and <coughs> and so on and, and many others that weren't even named but we know that at least for the the author were present and as as a, as a category on its own um, well, that's quite meaningful because, um, archaeologically speaking, we can't <coughs> trace that, or at least we have difficulties to actually trace uh, the various differences for how those peoples, uh, those people saw them. So, um, just to make you an example, in the Burgundian sources um, that are particularly rich uh, about um, artillery at this time, because Burgundy was um, uh, rapidly expanding from a military point of view was m one of the most uh, technologically advanced um, political po uh, military powers in in in, in Europe, um <coughs> and um and it was a, an administration that worked uh, in this because the the Duchy of Burgundy had expanded into the the Flanders and then the local um, craftsmen were quite advanced and, the produ and quite meticulous in their organization and production of weapons so we, we kind of get that uh, because sometimes we have markets that are that maybe produce the same pieces maybe in, in less numbers but that didn't write as much I mean I'm sure about I don't know in 15th century Romania we, we don't know pretty well what the situation was in terms of artillery production at least compared to Burgundy. Um, and um, at this time, the major centers were essentially um, Burgundy first, Tongue Truth, um, it, it was the most advanced, then France as a kingdom followed immediately, and for the wars of Italy, the French had a quite mighty um, uh, artillery park. Then uh, Italy was pretty advanced as well. Ferrara was um, seemingly one of the most advanced centers in, in absolute terms, but but also Venice, that since the 14th century, together with the Mamluks, had the um, the most recent and advanced um, <coughs> um, siege tec um, and artillery technology uh, of the Mediterranean. Um, so, um, and it's a world that that highly um, put this knowledge into, you know, in, into uh, 
circulation in a way or in another because we have to think that they were probably quite jealous uh, jealous of their own achievements but um, Europe at the time was so interconnected already and so um, people wrote a lot in this period we are in full age of humanism everything was known um, <coughs> so um, and th th I was making the example of Burgundy because um, the um, um, the names for artillery, for instance, um, uh, normally used at this time are only two, either bo bombers or uh, cannons. Um, and uh, we know that there were, as a matter of fact, differences. We will be seeing here what bombers were, what cannons, but um, it's just for, mm, in, 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 our, in, in the following uh, part of the century, that other names start to occur, like Culverine, Vaugler, Crapaud um, <coughs> and all these names that sometimes we don't r really even can understand what wha what they were aside some very mm, elementary characteristics. Um, so this can even tell us, uh, in part, it's not like an automatic process, but it, it's probably a hint of this that it's exactly at that point that these um, guns were diversifying in the process. So talking about the main um, artillery piece that existed at the time and the, m the most effective, the one that was used as a big gun in sieges etc. was renownedly uh, the Bombard, um <coughs> which was a, a type of cannon that, um, that really um, existed since, mm, since the 14th century, so it was something very uh, very old, um, and the first guns we basically, um, I don't know if the very first, but let's say that the, 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 the best document, the, the earliest documented gun, type of guns is definitely the Bombard, because um, that's how the whole thing, the whole pack, independently from the, the, the variations that th this could, these pieces could objectively have. Uh, because there was no standardization at all at this time, um, uh, they were called through this name. Um, and standardization here is important because in the 15th century, um, nothing was standardized. You know, every every piece was uh, still um, unique uh, in its kind. Um, and for most of the modern age, essentially, uh, mm, the craftsmanship, um, the, the the kind of uh, even pre-industrial levels uh, remain always um, in this fashion. Um, and standardiza uh, standardization was important, especially from a theoretical point of view, because um, if you had uh, guns that, that shot all more or less in the same way, you could rely on them in this sense, because they knew how, you know, how, how far they could shoot, um, uh, you know uh, what uh, how how you had to handle and and everything was simpler when you have all different pieces you kind of have to be attached to them in a certain ways but it's in, in probably this um mm, this lag wasn't felt more than much in the sense that as long as technology could make you have only um non standardized uh pieces um at the same time it was a, a military system that still probably didn't make an extensive use of these weapons and that therefore could rely on the knowledge of the single uh, crews that were used to, to, to that particular piece. Um, and um, so bombards quite, quite simply were um, simply a very uh, large size cannon that fired stone balls. Um, projectiles were in stone um, at this point. Um, and um, and they were actually quite cheap. You might think that projectiles would cost a lot, um, <coughs> but it's not really so. There were particular um, workers and artisans that were paid in the armies essentially to um, to to work the stones that they found around and to to uh, model them in order to to fit as as cannonballs and to shoot them. <coughs> so that was something that you could find relatively everywhere. And bombards uh, at that point were the biggest guns of all. 
um, at least as much as I know, um, I don't know much about East um, Eastern history, but uh, here we're talking about the West, and they definitely were. Um, and, and, and certain um, um, bombards could arrive to wait um, uh, an absurd um, weight of four tons. Um, so that can't <laughs> give you the dime, you know, the the the, the, the material uh, dimension, even of the problems that that, that such weights um, uh, entailed. Um, and um, and 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 even the shots, even the the, the missiles that it could shoot, could be mm, of many hundreds of, of kilos uh, in weight. Um, for instance, at um, um, at Bordeaux in 1420, um, there was um, uh, a very large bombard being used that shot um, stone projectiles of over. Um, I think s uh, around um, 300 kilos, something like this, uh, almost 800 pounds, um, and um, w there were also smaller projectiles at this time. Still, uh, mm, even the same projectiles weren't standardized, uh, so you could argue there could be also a kind of a mitraille effect with loading these guns with all like small stones or debris and just shooting the thing because really in warfare everything fits you know the, the you, you don't you, you know the employment of these weapons in, in, in actual action was really very far on average from from the ideals um, and um, but what was r extremely expensive at this age was actually gunpowder. You m you might not think about it, but uh, it wasn't uh, about the projectiles much, not even about the single pieces that with some investment could easily be produced in large numbers. Um, but it was actually the powder. Um, and not much even for the um, you know difficulty of producing it, but rather because um, I mean, in the actual working process, but because there were uh, there was actually a a poor, um, you know, um, access to it on the markets. So gunpowder costed a lot, a terrible lot, and it was it made up the the largest expense for um, artillery at this time. Um, there are estimates about fifteenth um, century artillery. Um, charges um, that, um, um, according to which, um, a, a single shot, a bombard shot, required something like 80 pounds, that is 36 kilos, um, for for each. So, um, you, that's that's really a lot. And, and think about, you know, mm, mm, even having that in your in your supply train, uh, you know. Uh, besides, it's something very dangerous because obviously powder can explode. At this time, uh, telling the truth, powder wasn't ma very refined. It's just in the 16th century that the Ottomans mm, bring granulation, that is the major improvement uh, in, in artillery at that time. Here, um, you know, it, uh, it was difficult in in a, in a certain measure, even to ignite, um, to ignite. I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, the the powder that could explode, but not with that devastating um, effects like it would happen in in especially during the modern age, later. But still, it was a dangerous thing. It could burn. It could explode as well. So, thinking about all the carts loaded with with gunpowder, I would have not liked to to stay close to them. Let me tell you. <laughs> Maybe with a torch or someone else, but um, something else. Uh, jokes aside, uh, the bombards, uh, as we were saying, um, have developed uh, since the 14th century. You find uh, bombards in the English army at the Battle of Crecy. Famously, they they didn't do much aside mm, terrifying mm <laughs> with their sound. Um, even though, uh, if I'm not wrong about Crecy, some sources claim that there were actually some, um, some, um, uh, you know, casualties inflicted at this point. But um, in, in, I mean, in battlefield, mm, you know, artillery wasn't meant really to cause 
a victim, to claim victims, to kill people objectively. It was a waste of time. Um, these um, weapons were used uh, in sieges. Um, they um, and by the 15th century, they 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 became basically the major feature of most siege uh, trains. Um, and um, and and the obvious use of of, of bombers was to to shoot the, these bolts to knock down the um, uh, the enemy walls. The obviously were largely in stone at this point, like in, in, in castellation and military engineering had um, steadily progressed during the, the the 12th and 14th century we have um, uh, I think historical accounts about um, bombers being used to, to break down um, walls uh, since like the 70s of the 14th century um, uh, one of the fir very first one it, it um, it should be at the siege of Saint Sauveur uh, le Vicomte in, in France, um, and um, and normally a bom an average bombard could um, um, you know um, could could arrive to to wait really um, uh, really a lot uh, before we we gave the number of of um, uh, roughly four tons but they could weigh up uh, even up to 20 tons uh, which is um, um, w which was like like monster bombards at that point and um, they, they, they would be even impossible to move at a certain point in the sense that you know if you have a 20 tons bombard uh, you, you needed like an, a huge um, uh, working force that you could easily and more profitably use for for something else uh, in terms of of combat. So um, sieges would would see uh, such guns used, but maybe the, the guns were left behind once that um, the the strategical theater you know progressed after the fall of the uh, of the fortress. Um, so um, and and there is a prejudice. Uh, towards medieval armies that w mm, pretending they were very slow. Um, telling the truth, I, I studied several campaigns in medieval history um, from a serious point of view that is on the sources very carefully. It took me one year once just to, to, to study uh, one full campaign. Um, and, uh, and I must say that um, medieval armies weren't um, weren't slow at all. They had an excellent logistics. They had nothing to, um, to d you know, to to envy to 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 the Roman armies. But indeed, during the late medieval times, the increase of artillery brought to um, in, in in consequence an increasement of of many logistical problems. Um, because the the real problem here is not really just moving uh, physically. Uh, the um, the mass of the cannon uh, that you can do with, with with some effort, but it's it's all where do you get the strength from? In, I mean, in terms of supplies, of food, of energies, of working force, of of sheer muscles that have to achieve that. So um, this would mean that the 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 supply train would would really um, inflate. Um, for using these pieces, and and that tells you, by the way, how you know usually um, there weren't many of them, <laughs> um, because technically Europe could produce um, potentially a, a quite large amount of these weapons, but in in battle, it's not until the 16th century that that the uh, military engineering refinement and technological advancements allow to to have mobile guns that could you know, um, be used uh, quite easily on, on a strategical scale, um, and um, so um, the traveling with a bomber could really hamper sensibly your uh, your uh, the, the, the speed of the army. Um, but eventually, if um, they were used, they, they were still worth uh, uh, the um, the cost. Um, and um, the mm, and, and, and normally um, lot especially the very large guns would be um, 
uh, carried on moved around uh, through uh, certain special reinforced carts um, that could sustain their enormous weight and uh, um, and there would be also uh, a large amount of pioneers uh, who ensured that um, the, uh, the the uh, the roads could you know could switch the passage of, of these uh, beasts <laughs> and uh, think about bridges you know the, the bridges could maybe uh, sustain an army passing but you know a concentrated uh, four tons of, of iron could uh, on the structure could really make the, the whole thing crumble um, so um, there would be also a lot of accidents and a lot of uh, other attritional factors related to the use of these guns um, and um, um, once at the siege uh, they, they were usually taken off uh, their carts by the mean of some cranes um, that um, in in in, in the uh, and then they they would be mounted uh, with uh, within larger reinforced frames or wood for firing also because um, hiring or lowering regarding you know the aiming and stuff could be achieved at that point through these very <coughs> big frames of wooden shafts uh, at that point and and that was was important because obviously you get a recoil and you you need a structure that you want to fire again in the same place that that keeps this mass firm in spite of the the violent energy relief that the explosion caused when the shot was fired um so um and there is a lot of debate telling the truth whether mm, um, whether mm, well we um maybe we can talk about this um later relatively to bomber bombards but uh, um maybe let's pass to to other kind of guns because w i want to make a general consideration at the end relatively to the actual effectiveness of these uh, guns in siege warfare. Uh, the other type of gun we talk about is the so-called Fauer or uh, Vogler uh, in French. Um, this word uh, deri is derived from actually the German Vogler or uh, Vogelfänger uh, and, and the Flemish uh, Vogler um that uh, because it seemingly there, there was a guy called Vogler that um that manufactured these guns um but it basically means fowler in fact and um and, and there is an um at the same time however uh maybe uh, but this is just an hypothesis and it's kind of stupid to say but let's say that these guns were were smaller than bombers and and were kind of thought, uh, at least mm, considering how they were made, uh, in order to achieve better uh, precision. Um, and um, and they appeared, interestingly, uh, r uh, late, uh, uh, at the very beginning of the 15th century. Uh, it was a sort of medium-sized type of cannon, um, widespread in, in Central Europe, especially in France, uh, Burgundy, and, and, and Germany. Um, and um, it's interesting because sometimes we get certain types of weapons um, according to the regional, um, the region of origin. Um, but we shouldn't be tricked more than much in the sense that sometimes it's it's just uh, a linguistical point. Uh, because, for instance, in in Italy there would be surely similar canons of this kind, but since they were called in another name, it's I it's it's different through the sources to cross um, uh, all the, the information to, to say yeah they were similar so if, if in, in a generally central European scenario we find a, a Vogler um, you can be sure that at that point in, in, in uh, Italy or Spain or, um <coughs> or, or somewhere else there would be something quite similar because there weren't substantial um, um, military, I mean technological differences at that time in Europe, 
um, and uh, um, and as we have seen, uh, also other regions of Europe were even more advanced than these ones, than some of these ones at least. Um, and it could uh, a Vogler could be like eight feet long, so um, not really, not really extremely much. It's like uh, and um, it, um, it's like two meters and thirty, I believe. Um, and it varied um, essentially to um, in weight to well, 100 um, um, 140 kilograms uh, roughly to even up to several thousand pounds so it could be um, but usually you know that they were small in the th of the small kind um, but ju this just for saying that certain categories that we spot in here could be such not m just for the size but for the the structure so you could have like giant things like or very small things and this happens not just in artillery but also in handguns um, uh, but also in w normal weaponry like in, uh, in white weapons <coughs> so, um, and, and, and what is interesting about it is that the, the Vogler was, was usually um, breech uh, had a, mm, was a breech loader, so you could charge it from the rear. Uh, it opened and you could set the charge and, um, and, um, and sometimes could be mounted over, uh, over small carts mm, that could mm, be easily moved around. Uh, alongside um, Ribot de Caen. And, and powder per shot for the Vogler uh, was uh, roughly uh, 18 kilos, roughly 40 pounds. So, as you understand, less than, than Bombard. And if you see uh, an average Vogler, from, from what we know uh, it, it could be, um, you, you immediately sense it was a sort of gun of precision compared to the Bombard. The Bombard was just throwing these very big rocks of even hundreds of kilos and to, to smash in s city walls. The, the Vogler here seems more like of a thing that, that says points there, you see those crossbowmen and those ant gunners on the wall, let's blow them up um, with a more precise shot. And this is, by the way, the, uh, the beginnings of the rationalization of the fact that the longer uh, the barrel was uh, compared to the caliber uh, the, um, the the shot would be more precise so they, they probably had al always known that but uh, this is uh, at this point that, that this differentiation at this stage uh, tells you that it was uh, in these years that they were refining the concept and kind of theorizing it better um, and uh, but and and that had been already problem already uh, only a problem of uh, of actual technological uh, achievements. Uh, it's not that they were stupid; then they hadn't seen that a longer barrel uh, shoots uh, more precisely and longer. Um, so and, and there were other types like the uh, crapado in French, uh, the or crapaud or crapaudin. Um, that um, seemingly it's it's the name today I think in French it's the name of, of a frog, <laughs> amusingly. Um, so they they got these names from very trivial things, telling you that um, it was nothing you know scientific or attached. And this is also important, enigmatically speaking, to understand how it works. Um, the whole thing. Um, and these things would be uh, the capodo, 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 yeah, were. Uh, really like f from four to eight feet in length so like like a man essentially and uh, um, and um, they um, and they were especially seemingly popular in 15th century France and Burgundy and um, and um, what is interesting is that this is this could even become a sort of a handgun or or a gun at least served by um, just two men maybe one fixing it on some stick and the other guy you know directioning the the shot and also cooperating for reloading uh, operations etc. We were quite slow guns all of these the, the recharge time was very low um, um, very slow sorry 
Um, and um, how in, the, in the Burgundian sources we find that uh, um, the Vauglaire uh, were usually uh, were usually something uh, shorter with a large bore, while the Crapado were long and thin. So, but this is this is just you know just to, to complicate the whole thing because um, everyone was literally calling these weapons like they wanted in in part. So. Um, uh, there are different interpretations. Um, and then the smallest guns said we can find um, uh, this point where the Colverin and uh, Serpentin or Colverins and Serpentines in, in English um, and um, they usually had um, they were characterized by long barrels especially in relation to their caliber uh, and that's the reason why they were called like uh, serpentines because they 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 looked like uh, snakes, like serpents, um, for their length. Uh, and and culverine, in fact, is, uh, comes from uh, colubra, which uh, I think in Latin means uh, a snake was a kind of snake. Um, also, in here we we kind of uh, have a, a substantial interchangeability of the term. We don't have to be too strict. Um, Charles the Bold had uh, a 30-foot serpentine um, and six more um, from 8 to 11 feet long at the famous siege of Neuss in Germany against to in, in 1474 and so um, as you understand um, there would be um, various sizes um, and, um, and 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 serpentines were distinguished from hand um, uh, excuse me the, the the hand culverines were distinguished because there would be also handguns called culverines at this point. Um, so in order to differentiate that from the piece of artillery and the handgun, which is not really even so easily from a scientific point of view, because w what is really a, a you know. Um, um you know, uh, a big culverin and a small culverin, but hey, let's just call them <laughs> in this way. So in French it would be culverin or grand culverin. So culverins are big culverins. And that tells you how, you know, the concept of the thing that had to shoot a projectile here uh, wasn't even conceived in terms of uh, equipping um, infantrymen rather than being kind of a artillery on their own regards, you know, it all depended <laughs> from what kind of piece you had. Um, at, um, uh, uh, regarding the Battle of, uh, of, uh, of Agincourt in 1415, uh, there were some um, witnesses like the uh, Sieur de Saint-Rémy, who was an eyewitness by the way that mentions um, there would be um, serpentines from the, Fran uh, on from the French side during the battle, while Montrelet refers uh, of uh, a very big number of of, um, uh, of um, cards and smaller cards, cannons, and ribaudcans uh, in during Agincourt, and um, and this tells you that. Um, uh um, how variable really it is these guns could be um, and, r and relatively to the um, uh, to the Colverin, uh, we must say that um, towards uh, the, the the 16th century um, uh, the um, um, the there would be an evolution of these uh, weapons towards uh, lengthening and uh, especially during the 16th century it seems that the Colvran was essentially a long-range uh, fire weapon. Uh, they, they were beginning to shoot uh, iron uh, shots um, so um, yeah it could really could really vary over time. In, in the earlier times it was seemingly was more of a handgun at a point, um, while in, in the early 16th century d d there, is, um, uh, there is an English uh, translation of the name Colveran which uh, identifies the, the weapon as a, a, um, a cannon firing uh, an 18 pound shot, this is roughly uh, 8 kilos. Um, so 
you can understand a really yeah it's pretty messy even to study <laughs> historically speaking um and um and yeah there, there is a uh, telling the truth the mention about martyrs um that appear towards uh the end of the 14th century in european warfare and especially the first um the first ones would be uh with a very large caliber eventually uh, becoming smaller during the 15th century. So at this point, it, it, it's, it's a little bit how it happened for the rest of artillery because the bombards were um, eventually abandoned during uh, towards the modern age because they were too imprecise. There were cannons that could were much more precise that could really put a lot more of energy uh, in a single shot. And... Um, uh, and therefore also mortars in this sense that were um, even not so extremely different from bombards initially speaking that they, they looked uh, more or less like ones but you understand they were mortars because they, they were a bit shorter and larger but really the um, the cast I mean not the actual cast of the piece but the the, the theoretical um, uh, origin was was similar uh, even in practice um so um even with mortars it would become you know like the modern mortars where there are you know mm, tubes uh, of, of a certain length with a relatively small caliber uh, at least compared to the initial one of mortars uh, of the early mortars and um the um the English at uh, Orléans in 1428 um, had seemingly uh, 15 breech-loading mortars in their siege train, so this is very interesting. Um, and um, looking a bit uh, south of the Alps, we have other examples of our weapons, like uh, the Paduans in 1387 had constructed uh, a huge cart containing 144 uh, bombardelle uh, in Italian, which basically means small bombards that uh, were evidently um, handguns. Well, they were at least portable in many ways, um, and 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 these uh, this card was organized in three banks of 48 guns, um, uh, each one uh, subdivided in turn into sets of 12, um, and. Um, and they could be shot simultaneously or in su succe succession, shooting stones um, the size of a hen's egg, according to the source. So you have these, even these multi-barrel um, weapons that existed at that time. They were mm, essentially adapted for from other bigger guns, and that were uh, there was a lot of experimentation at this time in firearms. So, and we're still very uh, at an early age here at the end of the 14th century, so it's interesting how all the various parts of Europe began to, to develop this um, and to diversify uh, artillery. Um, and I would like to make a point or on the, the actual effectiveness of these weapons in battlefield, because as was, I was um, just briefly reflecting on before, um, artillery um, actually um, until you know the invention of shrapnels and stuff like that um, on a long uh, scale etc wasn't uh, considered even in up to the Napoleonic age but even during uh, up to World War the first in some measure as um, something that had to really wipe out um, uh, people you know, our artillery uh, was too slow and too inaccurate to to achieve something like that. It was m in in proportion for for resources invested much more functional to to give um, soldiers a, a gun and shooting it, a handgun and shooting it. Um, so um, uh, and even if um, telling the truth, since the, the last decades of the 14th century, handguns um, begin to appear, um, especially roughly in proportion in of, of one third um, 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 infantrymen equipped with the with that uh, with these weapons out of the total of the whole army. Um, and, and they become a sensible tacti tactical variable, we, we objectively see that 
um, you know, handguns weren't really uh, the major weapon of the time. Crossbows were still widely used and they would be up well through the, the 16th century, even beyond in certain cases, but mm, at that point it was kind of an anachronism. So um, it's not that um, mm, firearms um, would be particularly useful aside from, from, from siege warfare. So um, the um, the you th there have been modern testing to what like the effectiveness of a bomber could be against f uh, fortified position, and it seems that overall it worked. I mean, there is no reason to think otherwise they would have not used it quite simply. However, um, on the battlefield, it it was in, in pitched battles. It, it basically. Um, it was. It would be even. Mm, they wouldn't even be necessary, frankly. Either, yeah. If you. If you had a bomber in your siege, in your supply, in, in your, mm, in your army at that point, and the enemy was attacking, you could use it in open field. We know it happened often, but it was more based on the circumstances than on the actual doctrine. That required it um, that it of its use. Um, so the um, um, there is no evidence that that in pitched battles these weapons ever had a particular impact. Um, we we know that uh, they were frightening. I mean, people had never heard, aside maybe from thunders, such violent sounds like the one of, uh, of a firing cannon. Um, before, I think, the siege of Constantinople, Mehmed II made a sort of public testing using um, his um, um, giant bombards, but, uh, um, you know, prescribing that the pregnant women had to be mm, sent far away <laughs> because they, they could have had um, negative uh, consequences from the from the fear that, that the explosions actually caused. Um, we know that large, bo and, and, and we know from Mehmed II and the siege of Constantinople 1453 how uh, some of, mm, you know, mm, how stone walls w weren't much capable, especially one built very long time before, uh, and that had lasted for centuries in certain cases in defense of cities, just like Constantinople couldn't withstand these uh, weapons. And this is why uh, at this time in the 15th century um, there is the uh, Trace uh, Italienne that begins to, 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 to form, like in Italy, that and they were at the, at the vanguard of military engineering, they began to, to build up um, this new um, uh, the new new type of um, of uh, of military architecture that would last until the um, the time of uh, of Louis the Fourteenth, um, and and it was designed exactly to 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 counter this um, the the fire of of, of these um, bombers, especially making you know um, creating different angles that could. Uh, really avoid the 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 cannons hitting really like at 90 degrees on the surface of of the walls, so that they, in order to reduce their efficacy and also building ram you know ditches and ramparts and other stuff, you know to to and also to 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 um, to make uh, fortifications um, shorter uh, because at up to that point, you know. The, the easiest thing had to be to build higher walls if you had the resources to achieve that. With, with firearms, uh, most of that changes. Even though um, the, the, the use of trebuchet had also triggered during the 13th uh, centuries, especially uh, a renovation of military engine in 12th and 13th centuries. Um, uh, an acceleration into military engineering um, innovations and stuff. So, um, and at this time, there was a brutal ac acceleration of military technologies related to to firearms. Um, and um, um, the uh, yeah, 
that that's it. And r relatively, however, to the effectiveness of um, of artillery in practice, even in sieges, th there is a debate even in here because um, there are examples into which it was plenty of uh, of guns all around sieges, and yet you know the, wall, uh, the siege failed. Uh, it's the case of Compiègne uh, in northeastern France, where eventually uh, Joan of Arc was captured, um, um, that, uh, which didn't fall to Philip the Good in 1430, despite the presence in the, uh, in the Burgundian um, uh, army of an extremely large number of uh, both gunpowder and weapons. Um, and um, there were at least, at least for f through the historical records uh, that, that we can know about, uh, five large bombers, two Vaugler, uh, one large and one small, many Colverines and um, uh, other, mm, other, other guns. Uh, and um, the, mm, um, the, the whole thing was um, an extremely heavy um heavy thing it was supported by a huge amount of uh of gunpowder um supplies that uh, seemingly were more than uh it was almost eight tons of gunpowder which if you really count them they uh for the average that we said before for for a bomber at least could shoot only two two hundred shots which wasn't a few, especially for those times, but overall it's not even this um, immense quantity for, you know, having a sort of hammering bombardment all the time. Um, and um, similarly, um, always Philip the Good met an, another situation like this in 1436, even uh, with an even larger artillery train uh, that consisted of 18 bombers, 20 uh, big Vogler, um, 98 Vogler, uh, smaller Vogler, um, and, and even, you know, 25, even smaller Vogler, uh, called pe uh, the, uh, the here is its section in Gross Vogler, Vogler, and Petit Vogler. Then 25 cannons, 22 uh, Crapaudot, uh, 52 uh, big culverins, and other 245 culverins, so this is really big, as as a an artillery park, um, and he was defeated uh, by uh, the English um, um, in, uh, in 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 less than twenty days. Um, so that tells you that um, the situation, you know, even if you had a lot of artillery, wasn't really you know the at this point uh, a determining factor, evidently. And going back on the siege of uh, of Neuss, um led by uh, Philip's son, uh, Charles the Bold, in 1474, um, which was waged for, over, uh, for, for almost a year, because it, it lasted from the, um, July the 30th, 1474, to June the 13th, 1475, so something extremely long. The Bur Burgundy had invested a huge quantity of resources in there, and it even failed, in fact. Uh, noise was constantly bombarded by the Burgundian artillery, and yet, the um, um, eventually the the, uh, the the inhabitants of Neuss didn't surrender. Um, Charles uh, used uh, bombards, uh, serpentines, col uh, culverins, um, other smaller guns, and, uh, and he had, uh, as, uh, by one according to one account, three hundred cards of guns. Um, uh, yeah, it was really a very imposing. Um, artillery park, and yet, also here, the whole thing failed. Um, telling the truth, Charles the Bold wasn't very lucky in military affairs. Um, we don't know whether, you know, this is can be um, maybe the commander's fault, maybe, too, but, you know, there are such, l this, there these are so, um, these are examples that show such a big display of artillery power, uh, firepower that, uh, uh, for those time standards, that you know, if they all fail, there is probably something structural that tells you historically that even such a big amount of artillery wasn't d determining uh, 
which the uh, the outcome of the siege in, in spite of you know the very fierce um you know it's not that it was an easy um uh, uh game for the defenders obviously they they suffered enormously but you know warfare even if it was not enough um and um yeah and um the um I think this is more or less what I wanted to say. Um, I will talk about artillery in the future once again. I'm not a great expert of artillery, as you probably understood. <laughs> um, uh, I'm really collecting this data but and kind of synthesizing them, but uh, um, it's an important topic, and I think it's interesting because I it also reveals a lot about uh, the history of techno technology. And um, and I'm really against uh, the modernistic pr um, prejudices towards you know technology that it's meant to win over everything. No, technology uh, is useful only if you have the conditions to use it um, effectively. So the um, the rest and in, in, in war things can change really much. Also because it's your enemy that is going to make it change. Um, in order to put you in, in disadvantage, so um, really, when you when you think about firearms, I never think they were like yeah, they were something that m they were the most powerful weapons that the, the world had ever seen at that point. But yet, they they didn't make uh, wars won all the time, uh, and yet, mm, you know, th there are still big uh, chapters like. You know the French uh, during the Hundred Years' War essentially they have to tank uh, <laughs> gunpowder uh, because otherwise they would have remained keeping you know um, slaughtered by the the English armies with longbows and uh, and uh, and men at arms on foot you know and uh, and it's that thanks to to artillery that France had uh, to pay for it. It's interesting also that France was a usually a traditionalist. Um, country military affairs mm, developed artillery quite consistently in the, at the beginning of the modern age uh, the French and, and always telling the truth the French always had the best artillery from from Francis the first from Louis the 14th and uh, uh, and Napoleon you know France uh, has good guns <laughs> I must say that um, and uh, I mean, yeah, they solved uh, the impasse, especially in, in a war like the Hundred Years' War that was a typically medieval one in a typical um, fortified, medieval fortified environment. Artillery uh, really accelerated brutally the, the war in favor of the French because they had invested more in that. However, yeah. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, please um, share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel to receive further uh, news. Um, and uh, if you, as always, I, I thank you heartily for listening to me and uh, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye!